Hey, um, history people, I hope you guys are all doing well. Um, I wanted to pop on here and actually um, just give you a little bit of information um, about political parties. And for those of you that were in class and are reviewing this, um, great idea. For those in cohort C, this is going to be really important for you to watch um, the whole thing through. So hang in there. I'm going to make it as quick as possible. And if I'm really lucky, I'm going to get this on my YouTube channel, which is my new challenge for the week. So I want to start by sharing a screen with you and um, hopefully helping you to understand um, a little bit more. Hold on one second. Sorry, guys hit the wrong button. Um, hopefully helping you to understand a little bit more about um, how the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists move into the political party realm. So this is a sheet that was found um, or should have been found on your week five folder. There's actually an assignment that goes with it that's not due until Sunday. So I wanted to do two things. I wanna go through this sheet and then just quickly remind you about what that assignment looks like. So here's the bottom line. We have an American revolution that the United States wins. And out of that comes the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation, of course, don't work. And so the constitution is written. As you can imagine, as with many things, not everyone agrees that the Constitution is the way to govern. So there are two groups that emerge. One are the Federalists, okay, so right here. The Federalists are for the Constitution, so F and F, Federalist and for. They like it the way it's written. They think a strong government is what the uh, little burgeoning United States needs. On the other side, you have the Anti-Federalists. The Anti-Federalists are against the Constitution at it, as it is currently written. Um, anti means against, so A and A. Um, Anti-Federalists feel that the government of the Constitution is too big. So there are some examples here of quotes, um, and these quotes will explain in more detail in the language of the founding um, fathers exactly what um, each side uh, gives as an explanation. So, uh, for example, under Federalist, okay, so look at the second, second quote. It says, a strong national government can provide individual freedom, peace among the states, and a means of defense against foreign nations. In other words, there needs to be a strong national government. Now that fits, right? Because we're talking about federalists, we're talking about people that are for the constitution. So that's something that completely works in terms of those that support the constitution as it is. Under this anti-federalist excerpt or quote, um, the first one works. The constitution created a national government with monstrous powers that will not guarantee the rights of individuals. So this, for example, is using the word monstrous. So this constitution that was written is this huge monster of a document and it's not gonna give anybody personal freedom. So those are two examples of how the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists are going to communicate their dissatisfaction. That being said, your assignment, and please don't use the quotes that we've that I just went over in, in this video, um, but you are going to, for this assignment, and this assignment is, is connected to this in this uh, week five folder, um, and it is, what, what I want you to do is I want you to pick one of these quotes for the Federalists and then a quote for the Anti-Federalists, and you are going to explain what each one of those quotes mean. So just one for the Federalist, so over here, and then just one for Anti-Federalist over here, pick the quotes, explain what they mean. Okay, I hope that helps a little bit. I also then want to take a look at a sheet <coughs> excuse me, um, that deals with this concept of political party. 
because ultimately what comes from the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists is going to be a Bill of Rights, okay? So if you are um, haven't watched the video, now would be the time to do that, okay? So after um, you've worked through this a little bit. But I want you to see, I wanna hopefully be clear about the transition from these Federalists and Anti-Federalists and their beliefs and their, their way that they see government and how that evolves into these political parties. So let's take a look at political parties in general. This is a reading found in your folder. I'm going to go through and highlight the stuff that I want you to actually um, understand. And I would recommend that you take four or five minutes to just go through uh, this information for yourself. Um, but this is the goal of this handout is to just help you to understand political parties in general. So what you have here in this first paragraph is a bit of a surprise for some people. And that is that George Washington does not support the development of political parties. And he doesn't support the, the development of, of political, political, sorry, political problem or parties. I'm going to get this out um, because he believes that it will defi divide the people. Uh, and it would create small groups with limited interests that would not be able to come to any sort of agreement, or the word is consensus, about anything. And so it would be a negative to the system. If you move down for, further, we actually take a look at these political parties and their roles, because as much as George Washington does not think that political parties should be a part of governing, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists are going to evolve themselves into political parties. And so what do those look like? What is the purpose of those? Okay. Um, one of the purposes is to um, run candidates for political office. Now we are aware of how that works because we have been studying um, the election season. So President uh, Trump will be running as a Republican, so he is associated with that Republican Party, and President, Vice President, excuse me, Biden will be running for the Democrats. So we're talking about that political party. There's a lot more in terms of people that are running, okay, but that's the the basic idea is to understand that each party is going to have candidates for the ver the variety of different offices that are up for grabs. The second, and this one's interesting to me, so I'm right here, you guys, checking the other party. Um, I have just read an article that talked about how, as part of the way that democracy works, liberals, Democrats, Republicans, or conservatives, their going back and forth is part of the check and balances process. Um, and somebody in class even said, it's not just Republicans and Democrats, it's different beliefs and different like branches of department uh, of political parties that also create that check and balance. So it is important that these political parties kind of go back and forth because they do check um, the process. Informing the public. So getting the message out to the public. What is it that as a political party we believe in? Do you want to join us through that process? Um, do you want to solve problems the way we do? Those are all part of informing the public. Organizing government, of course, is about laws and policies, and typically those things run kind of by their political um, affiliation. And so Republicans have one idea, Democrats have another. Um, a two-party system. Um, this is something um, that we, I think you actually guys already know. There, of course, is a two-party system in the United States, and it is Republicans and Democrats. Um, they are not the only parties that are a part of the political system that is the United States. 
they are the political parties, Democrats and Republicans, that essentially kind of rule the school, right? They are the group that is going to make laws and pass policy and things of that sort. But this little chunk here um, is an example um, called the Greens, the Green Party USA. So they are a political party that focuses on, on ecology and, in, in the, and the environment. Now, Mr. Obarski shared with many of us in class that when he voted, because he voted not too long ago for president um, through an absentee ballot, that he saw 13 to 14 different candidates for the presidency. So we know that there are, are other individuals out there, parties and individuals that are running for office with those parties. Probably the biggest thing is this idea of consensus of values. Consensus means something we can agree on. Um, this is something that runs, I think, throughout the thread of what we've been talking about so far. And that is that we all believe in different angles and um, expressions of the way the government should work and the, the country should look like. And you are always gonna probably line yourself up with somebody who agrees. So this idea of consensus of values is probably the biggest scope that you will see when it comes to um, why political parties work the way that they do. Okay, so again, going back, it's about parties and how do parties line up? How do they share their values? How do they act in government? So although I have spent you know, a couple minutes here going through this, please take another couple minutes and read through it as well. Okay. So we're gonna do one more thing before we're done today. Um, if you have questions on the stuff prior and on anything, you guys know you should always get a hold of me. But we're gonna finish up today with a PowerPoint um, and I'm gonna walk through this. Um, it's not going to take too terribly long, but it, there are some things that I need to get across to you, especially cohort C, who um, is not sitting with us in class. So I'm going to share the screen again, and I'm going to put this PowerPoint up into play. And I want to, we're going to go back, I want to spend some time going through this information on political parties. Okay, the evolution of political parties. So this, this first slide is just my introductory slide. And there's, there's several uh, political parties that are actually um, listed on this slide, all of which are, or are political parties like the progressives or the prohibition party. They are political parties but again, we have that two party system. So many of these political parties are going to make an attempt to push into the system that is the United States over the course of history, some of them significantly so, and we will study them. But that two party system is still the way things work. Okay, so for the 15th time, because you should have followed along with the Federalist and Anti-Federalist that I gave to you just talking about that assignment that's due on Sunday. You need to, if you haven't done it so far, watch the video that's posted because that's going to talk about Federalist and, and Anti-Federalist and what that looks like. And now we're going to review it for like the third time. So this should be solid. Now, when I do a PowerPoint of this sort, if you feel like you're comfortable with the information, you've already written down and written it down in some other capacity, don't do it again. So don't repeat things. Um, it's the new information that you really need to get a, a hold of. And I'm gonna point out and emphasize a few things on each slide of this PowerPoint. So, Again, back to the Federalists, the group of individuals who believe that the Constitution in its original form is a good thing. So supporters of the Constitution, shared powers between national and state government, stronger national government, better educated and prepared. That's kind of a weird, weird line. And, and really all I mean is that, that 
they, there is more formal education found within those leaders that tend to be federalists. So it's not honestly very well written um, by me, but that's what I was looking for. If I would emphasize anything on this slide, it would be this second point. Because we talked about this, we talked about this, but the shared powers between the national and state government is really important, okay? So remember that these shared powers that we talked about last week is actually called federalism, but the federalists, hence, right, the name federalism, the term federalism, um, is that national and state governments do share power. So there is some sharing of power under what the federalists believe in terms of the constitution being good the way, the way it's written. Now the anti-federalists of course, don't like what has been written. Um, I want you to draw your attention to um, this word tyrant. A tyrant is someone who has complete control. Tyranny is complete control. So you'll hear that term every once in a while when we talk about pre-revolutionary and post-revolutionary like government developing times in history. Um, but the, the biggest thing with the anti-federalists is their concern that that bigger government that is the constitution is gonna take over their life like the king did. Their primary belief, okay, is that strong state governments are needed. Okay, strong state governments are needed. In fact, one of the arguments against the compromise, which is the Bill of Rights, is anti-federalists will say, but all of our states have bills of rights anyway. Why do we need to add a national one? We don't want that much power um, at, the, at the level of, of, of the constitution as it's written. The ultimate agreement is a Bill of Rights, <clears throat> 10. And you will have watched this video that was posted before, and it will talk about the process of how did we get bill, a Bill of Rights? How come it's 10? How come it's not 200? There's a real reason for that. And you need to be cognizant of that. You need to be understanding of that. Okay. Um, amendments, something I'm relatively sure that you learned in uh, last year in trimester two, but just is totally worth mentioning again, is that amendments, Okay, the term amendment are changes to the Constitution or additions. So the idea that the Constitution being written in 1789 and the Constitution in 2020 might have to have a few adjustments. And that's what amending the Constitution is really about. Yes, this is spelled incorrectly, but I still do mean Constitution. Okay, so I'm going to take a breath. And I wanna talk about political parties. This is our ultimate place that we want to be. So one more time, you have this, these federalists and anti-federalists that have very strong beliefs. And then now you're gonna to start to see this evolution into these parties. So Hamilton, perfect example. Hamilton is going to is going to lead, create, but lead a political party called the Federalists. So really, truly, you guys, in your notes, maybe put Federalists, okay, this concept of Federalists up to Hamilton, okay? So bring that, that Federalist concept up to Hamilton, okay? Couple things to know. Strong central government. So as the Federalist Party Hamilton, not surprisingly, is going to support a strong central government. Um, the demographics, so the group of people that are going to be most commonly supportive of the Federalist Party is going to be that of business and industry. There also is going to be a philosophical belief, something called the Elastic Clause. Okay, I want to show you something can actually pull this off my desk at home. So here I have a rubber band, okay? Rubber bands are by their very nature elastic. So on this rubber band, I can put these three little notebooks, which is what 
was holding, this rubber band was holding those things, or I can take this entire envelope and I can put the rubber band around this envelope. So how does this metaphor work? This metaphor works in that people who are federalists look at the constitution and they say, okay, it's written, but it needs to be flexible. It needs to stretch because when the constitution is written in 1789, the world is going to be a different place in 2020. And so we need to let the constitution move as it needs to move to actually govern the people. Okay, so one more time, this idea of the constitution being flexible and allowing governing to happen applying the world around them, okay, to actually um, make the constitution work. Okay. Jefferson. Jefferson is going to be the leader of the Democratic Republicans. So again, maybe put this up by Jefferson. Um, yes, it is the Democratic Republicans. That is not a mis- uh, you know, I'm mistyping. Um, this is actually the first political party that is opposite of the Federalists. So these guys are guys that are really truly anti-Federalists. So as you can imagine, the Democratic Republicans and Jefferson want powers to be left to the states. They want, or they, agriculture is the demographic that is typically the most influenced and supports Democratic Republicans. And philosophically speaking, the Democratic Republicans are strict constructionists. So to use a metaphor as well, when you construct something, you build it. Um, when we're talking about the Constitution and applying that, what, what the anti-federalists slash the Democratic Republicans, so we are talking about Democratic Republicans here, they are gonna look at the constitution and they're gonna say, okay, it was crafted for these reasons. These articles were put the way they were for all of the reasons listed. The amendments or the additions and changes were put together for all of these reasons that were mentioned. And strict constructionists follow the constitution pretty much letter to letter. So there is not that elastic clause. It is not as flexible. It's two very different ways of governing. And when I say governing, I mean by the courts, because the courts are going to interpret laws that are passed, policies, executive orders, and they're going to have to decide if those particular laws or um, court cases or whatever the case is, how they apply to the Constitution. Can we be flexible? as federalists would say, or do we have to go to the letter of the law? In other words, exactly, or very close to how the, the, um, the constitution was written as democratic Republicans believe. Now, here's a part of the current events that we've talked about. So let's talk about the world of the Supreme Court. In the court, the nine justices, the eight, but then eventually nine justices typically take a, a view of either elasticity, so being flexible in the elastic clause, or they tend to be strict constructionists. So they look much more closely at the actual um, wordage and verbiage of the constitution. Amy Coney Barrett is a strict constructionist. So she is going to look um, at things much more, much more closely aligned with how the constitution was originally written and try to determine what the founding fathers would want in the context of that strict constructionism philosophy. The Supreme Court with the, the nomination and then the confirmation of Judge Barrett is in all likelihood going to be primarily more made up of strict constructionists. So they are going to, as a court, probably about six of them most often, are going to look and say, we look at the courts in a very strict manner, or excuse me, the cases in this court in a strict manner, where we don't allow for a lot of flexibility, because we think we need to absolutely, you know, respect the Constitution as it was written. And so there are going to be decisions that are likely going to be changed. And if you are a, a, a 
practicer, a believer in the elastic clause, that is going to be concerning to you. So that is how that can apply to a current situation. And you'll hear the word strict constructionist or originalist, which is kind of the same thing, but enough for you guys in terms of just basic understanding when we talk about and people talk about judge slash ultimately Justice Barrett. Okay. So last thing, the political spectrum. Now, I know that you have seen this before because I know Mr. Obarski did it um, the first week of school. I did it the second with my, with my scratchy writing. Um, but I want to look at this just in a little bit of a different way. So I'm going to sit up a little bit because I need to use my hands on this one. As you can tell, I'm a hand person. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm making noise moving around here. But I want to start in the middle. Okay, and in the middle, we're talking about the independent or the independent um, citizen. Someone who is an independent doesn't commit to, to either side. They do not commit to Republicans or Democrats. Sometimes they do, but not as a whole. They probably look at specific issues that they have in mind, but they don't necessarily feel like they fit the philosophy of Democrats and Republicans. So you have these independents right down the middle. Now, I want to break out from this a little bit um, and talk about a few things. So let's go to the left of independent. Now, if someone references the left, they are talking about that more progressive, okay, democratic, liberal side of the political spectrum. So the Joe Bidens and the Kamala Harris's of uh, politics, they are over on this side. Now, liberal, Democrat, progressive, sometimes they're used interchangeably. Some people say the term liberal is way, way, way to the left. Okay, so as you see this political spectrum um, further and further to the left where it's not healthy, um, but it really depends on who is, who is using what term and what they mean by that. But to the left, the left is Democrat, progressive, and liberal. I want to talk about socialism and communism just for a minute. These are typically referenced as economic systems, which again, I think you know. Um, socialism in particular is something that is um, partially used incorrectly right now. That was a weird sentence, but um, socialism is definitely the sharing of uh, a business perhaps or a social program by the government. So an example is one of the, the most popular um, type of, of government programs that are, um, that government is a part of is medicine, is healthcare. So the European countries and Canada, for example, have medicine that is controlled or run by government. And so you pay more taxes for that, but then everybody has access to healthcare. It's referenced as socialized medicine. So you're definitely gonna pay more in taxes. The upside is that everybody's gonna have healthcare. So if you don't make a lot of money, you're still gonna have healthcare. Um, if you know there's some reason you can't pay for it, you're still going to have healthcare. So that is clearly an advantage, um, but it is concerning to some people. Now in the world of Facebook, which is the old person um, social media source, there is a lot of use of the word socialism as just a terribly extreme concept. Now, yes, it's over here on the left. There's no doubting that, okay, that it's there. Um, but oftentimes I think people in their heads associate socialism with dictatorship. That's not the case. You can be a democratic socialist. Bernie Sanders identifies himself that way. Now, some would look at him and say, oh my gosh, he's just a socialist and a communist and he wants government to control everything. There are arguments to be made for that. There are arguments to be made against that. But I want you to just make sure that you're listening to those ideas of socialism and just processing in your head what is it that the reference is being made? Are people very scared? And that's why they're making the comment, you know, what is the, what is the angle? So it, it's not 
that people are are totally wrong, but I think it's used in, in contexts that might be less effective um, and come from people who are really, really scared of socialism taking over the entire country. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case, but um, you know, just just be aware of where it falls. To the furthest left, you can see communism. Communism is interesting. Um, communism as an economic system actually promotes um, equality and it promotes equality in the economic sense. Um, it does not allow for personal liberties, which is a big problem, obviously. Um, but in its purest form, the idea is that people would have an equal amount of food, a place to live. They would have equal access to everything. China tried it a long time ago. It did not work. So communism, as we know it, is referenced as uh, North Korea, um, Cuba, and Russia. Those countries have dictators and they have small gr groups and parties that are running the whole country. So whether or not we, we really wanna call it communist, probably not, but definitely the idea of a dictatorship controlling a small group of people, controlling the country is part of that understanding of communism. So again, it's kind of a quirky thing, but I want you to understand the idea of an economic system doesn't work in its purest form, is oftentimes a, a, attached, if not all the time, attached to a dictatorship. And that, of course, is different than what we have um, seen in terms of what, what communism really, really looks like. So let's go to the right. So when you hear a reference to the right, we're talking about this right side of the political spectrum. So you're going to hear the term Republican and conservative used interchangeably. This term down here, moderate, it's interesting because Mr. Obarski and I talk about the fact that it seems like an odd word because you can be a moderate Democrat. So I'm going to be really totally blunt with you. I'm not sure what would be a better word. Um, I, I think you can definitely use moderate with Republican. It's not that, but for me, my context of, of knowledge is that that's a word that's used both, both on both sides. But for your information, we can just keep it here, use it here, and then move further to the right to, to Republican and conservative. Whoops, sorry guys. Okay, um, so to the, to the right of that is a group of people called the Tea Party. The Tea Party is a, is a, a offshoot, obviously, to the far right of Republicans. It's about state governments pretty much only being part of the governing class, um, getting deconstructing government. I think I remember reading an article that talked about the idea that the Tea Party felt like maybe the Department of Education wasn't necessary, and I'm sure other departments as well. Um, but it is an example of this idea of, of state government and state government being in control. And then you have fascism. And the best way to understand fascism is to pull from fascist countries like Nazi Germany. Um, Nazi Germany, of course, was a country that was nationalistic to the extreme. What I mean by that is Fascism is about being so proud of your country that everybody else is insignificant and of lesser value. Those countries not only are very um, nationalistic to the extreme, but they also scapegoat a group of people. So they blame a group of people on or for all of their shortcomings, for poverty, for the things that, that aren't working well in a country. And so you scapegoat them and then you get rid of them, the Jewish genocide. Okay, so that's, that's an example of how that works. It also requires a dictator and a very small group of people running public policy. So if you're looking at the, this full name, the, the National Socialist Party, that is part of the name of the Nazi party, socialist is in there. Um, and it is about government control, but don't be confused in terms of, of socialism. Fascism has a lot more to it 
Okay, and it's that extreme um, idea of, again, nationalism, scapegoating people, murdering people that you feel like are against you. Your country is so valuable, less countries are, or other countries are less valuable. So that is the far right. Okay, so that's to the far right. So again, independent down the middle. When we talk about the left, we're talking about progressives, Democrats, liberals. Okay, there are two other, the socialism and communism that moves further to the left. So they are more extreme to the right or the right. When somebody says the right, we're talking about Republicans and conservatives. And as with the left, if you keep moving to the further extreme, you then have Tea Party and you have fascism. So we really do exist within the context of Democrats and Republicans and progressives and moderates and liberals and conservatives. That's, that's really where we live, but there are definitely these other extremes. So just to recap, Federalists versus Anti-Federalists. Federalists became the Federalist Party. The Anti-Federalists became the Democratic Republicans watch the video that talked about how those two, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists were to come to some agreement with the Bill of Rights. And then make sure that you go through that PowerPoint again, especially that last slide. Now, what you'll have after this is you will take a personal inventory, um, political party affiliation kind of a quiz. It's online, it's linked in your folder. Then you're gonna take a look at a, um, a article, I suppose a website, CNN actually, that goes through how does one participate politically? So you learn about political parties, you figure out where you fall, and then you talk about how is it that I can participate politically speaking if I should choose to do so. The last assignment that you have is a podcast, um, about 32 minutes, and it pulls everything from the last week or so together. There are four or five questions that you're gonna need to answer, which is the assignment for this week, okay? To wrap up the information from this week. I think I put it due Tuesday. So Sunday, you have that assignment that is in week five with the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. And then Tuesday, you have due that podcast, which is the bottom um, last activity that you are supposed to do in that week six folder. So a lot of information. Um, please feel free to, to message or if you need to zoom you guys you can absolutely do that even if you are cohort c and you've already zoomed i would much rather have you understand the assignments because we're really starting to build we have an election coming up two weeks from today and so we will reference political parties the left the right we'll continue to move through that process the electoral college which is a part of that podcast that i told you about we're going to dig into that deeper so it's up to you to make sure you're clear about information. Ask me for clarification. Ask me for help. That is why I am here. Have a really awesome day. I'm looking out my window at home and it's very, very snowy. So um, hopefully we will um, see you guys on Thursday. I'm not in the building, but you know, you get be safe tonight and, and all of that. So um, let me know if you need anything and we will talk to you soon. Have a good one.